a lady helps you to get up, maybe you discover it's the love of your life. So although you know well it was a pure contingency, but the way you experience it, all the, your life, if you're a romantic like I am, you are waiting for that moment. We have to live with this contradiction. So philosophy is like falling in love. Absolutely. Slavo Zizek, welcome to How the Light Gets In. Thanks very much, although immediately, as a Hegelian, I must correct you. You know, something happens with Kant already, and then Schelling Hegel, till that point of German idealism, uh, light was associated with subjectivity. Subject is a light, darkness is outside in chaotic nature. But already there are some hints in Kant, his basic late text on religion within the reasons of, within the limits of reason alone, Schelling, of course, and Hegel, the symbol of the inner symbol, metaphor for the innermost core of the subject is night, darkness, the night of the world. Hegel says this wonderfully in some of his early texts, that it's this night, if you look somebody in the eye, you see objects, but cut into pieces, just floating around, and everything emerges out of this. So I would say, how does the light get in, in a bad way? Light obfuscates this core of the subject, where both Hegel and Schelling refer to Jacob, Jacob, Böhme, and other uh, uh, mystics. But well, speaking of darkness, you have a famous uh, Hegel quote that you like to, to use lately, which is that the Owl of Minerva flies at dusk, at the end of something, at the end of the period. But Hegel has also this other quote where he says that philosophy is its own time comprehended in thought. And I was wondering, how do you reconcile those two quotes? They are, they you mean, I think, he even says, I think, both things in the same paragraph. What he means is that we live in a certain epoch, but all we can do in our thinking is to grasp the conceptual structure at its purest of this epoch. And for this reason, so philosophy always comes too late. Hegel is fanatically against any plans for the future and so on. And for this reason, I'm a total partisan of another materialist reversal of Marx into Hegel. Hegel was at this level very modest. He openly admitted we can make some guesses and so on, but uh, Marx was way too idealist for Hegel. Marx knew that generally, at least if you have the right subjective position, the exploited workers, we can somehow get, he was not a full determinist Marx, but the, let's call it, objective tendency of history. Like if we don't screw it up, something may be better, socialism, communism awaits us. What Hegel would have said, and that's why we, uh, we uh, need Hegel, where Hegel is at his best is, he takes the beginning of a great epoch where there are all the promises about big achievement and shows how more or less necessarily it turns wrong. His big example was, of course, French Revolution. Freedom, terror. But I think Hegel would have felt like fish in its own water in later time. Look at the second half of 19th century. Not in the colonies, it's another story, but in Europe. It was a big era of progress. Even in Russia, they abolished serfdom. In Germany, Bismarck introduced first elements of global health care, retirement plans, suffragette, and so on. So the idea was things go on. Then you get 
the Great War, the First World War, which was, I think, the event, in some sense, much worse than Second World. Second World War was just an after effect. And sorry that I talked too much, but you know who is here? I must admit it, although he was not such a great theoretician as Marx. You know who, one of the few who predicted even the Second World War in 1880 already? Engels, in some letter, saw the signs. He says the way it goes now, Germany will want a stronger place in dividing colonially the world. So there will be a world war. And with, he was just lucky, I think, with an incredible foresight. Engels says this war will end up maybe with revolution, at, at least in some country, like Russia. And then he says there will be around... 10 million dead people. The official number today is 9,800,000. And then in an ingenious addition, he says that if Germany loses, maybe a decade or two later, Germany will trigger another war. So that's the paradox of Marx and Hegel. They were not idiots in concrete predictions. They were often very accurate. But back to Hegel, uh, what why 20th century would be ideal ground for Hegel? Look what happened. October Revolution, great promise. Ah, ah, sorry, Comrade Stalin is there raising up. Then we have Fukuyama, the end of history, we are there. Ha, ha, sorry, we know where we are today. This is the Hegel we need today. It doesn't mean we should do nothing. But Hegel's lesson is... History repeats itself, not in the sense of repeating the same, but things go wrong necessarily, and only in the second attempt, maybe you can get it right. So Hegel's whole idea was not to turn against French Revolution because of the terror, but how to do it again at a higher level, whatever. So don't you think we terribly need this Hegelian pessimism today. Like Hegel, we, all the theorists of global capitalism, global liberal market, they are describing a form which is already disappearing, if you ask me. Here I agree with my friend who doesn't agree with me on many other things, Yanis Varoufakis, who said, what is happening now? He is not moralistically complaining, but the idea is with figures like Bill Gates uh, or uh, uh, Elon Musk and so on, this is no longer old liberal capitalism. There are many theories like neo, -fe uh, neo feudalism, uh, corporate authoritarianism, but something new is emerging and we ha are disoriented. We don't really know what is happening. You know, the last text Hegel wrote was his uh, 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 some notes on the English reform bill. He appears reactionary there. He warns uh, against expanding the, uh, uh, universalizing the right to vote. But hidden in this are some pearls. He foresees a future in which, because the old estate hierarchic society will disappear, uh, the rebel will be controlled and manipulated by what he calls rich rebel, the ruthless nouveau rich, and it will be even worse in this sense. And he was right. If nothing else, today it's happening. This is happening. What is philosophy making sense of today, given what the mainstream philosophical movement is, for the most part, analytic philosophy in the English-speaking world? What is it capturing? Is it capturing an aspect of our time? You know what's my point here? That I nonetheless have some hopes that a new era is slowly beginning also in philosophy. Uh, till 20 years ago, I would say, it's approximate, we had a clear division between analytic philosophy, which also included got mixed with brain sciences and so on. So I know in some American big universities, you had this paradox that if you dissect the brain of a, of a, of a rat, it's philosophy. If you study Hegel, it's literature. They were saying it's like, so we had this uh, uh, 
attitude best expressed in the introduction to the last book by Stephen Hawking. Although he simplified it very much, but at some point he was right. The result of this, what we called discourse analysis, predominance in continental orientation, is that many basic, let's call them naively, big metaphysical questions. Does the universe have an origin or end? Do we have free will? You look in sciences for the answer. Does the universe have an origin? That's what quantum physics cosmology is. Do we have free will? That's what, that's what uh, cognitive sciences are trying to do. On the other hand, the continental orientation got more and more lost into what I call transcendental historicism. That you, it, the, Many others were doing the same thing, but the clear case is for me here, somebody like Michel Foucault. If you were to ask him, for example, what I will be asked in a debate now, uh, is there objective morality? His answer would have been, all we can say is that to raise such a question is possible only within a certain episteme a certain horizon of meaning. Such a question wouldn't even have meaning in medieval times, where in some sense morality was objective, inscribed into, so he would, uh, for him, German have this beautiful word, un uh, hintergeber, which means you cannot go behind. The ultimate horizon is what Foucault calls episteme, the horizon of knowledge through which we observe in reality and interact with it. And there are, of course, great examples. Like with modern science, it's not just I believe in science, that it's more true, is that this difference emerged between reality out there and meanings we project into it. So it's not just that uh, science is more truthful. The meaning of what is nature, of what is truth, changed. And so the result, unfortunately, is that the so-called deconstructionism or this historicist hermeneutics, all in it, all you can do is describe, analyze the horizon of meaning within which we move. And let's call them naively, the big questions are simply dismissed as irrelevant. I see trends lately to move beyond this. At different levels, and with many of them, I am even caught in polemics. For example, uh, this object-oriented ontology, and so on, and so on. But I think the general direction is the right one. And my second point here is that I find hope. Isn't it that till now, by now I mean 30, 40 years, the latest advances in digital manipulations, brain sciences, and so on, till now, with all the new problems like nuclear explosions, somehow, basically, the old morality still fitted. You could rely to it. But with what is happening now, for example, that's why pandemic interested me. We, you know that the big debate, masks, yes or no, social distancing, this was at some level a properly philosophical debate. If we obey all the injunctions of doctors, healthcare institutions, are we still free or not? Do we still retain our human dignity? So here is my optimism. As bad as things look, we will need philosophy more than ever, because again, in our everyday problems, it began with abortion. It's basically almost a philosophical problem, you know. Is it already a living being? Do we have the right or not? So uh, these are not good news, because as Hegel knew it, already in his early System der Sittlichkeit, System of Customs, Mors, uh, times when philosophy is needed are difficult times, are times of trouble. But I don't worry about us 
philosophers becoming useless, because that's the last point. I don't expect from philosophers solutions. The big problem today is rather that when we confront new phenomena, we formulate, we approach the problem in the old terms. I think the biggest role philosophy can do today is to correct or at least make us think of how we approach the problems. That's why as a philosopher, for example, I oppose deep ecology because I think it's secretly still radically anthropocentric. You know, it's, uh, it's this idea that somehow rivers and forests have their rights. Yes, but they don't know it. So we humans, even if they emphasize we are just one of the species, but we are the only ones who have the universal view. This is, I think, and don't underestimate this, the big role of philosophy today, to not to offer solutions, but to enable us to ask the right questions. Mystifications begin already at this level, when we are aware of a problem, but formulate it in the wrong way. So one of the big frameworks that philosophy and science have been operating under uh, for you know, decades now is this kind of like some kind of form of individualism and some form of reductionism. The idea that the, the relevant unit in any kind of explanation is the individual, and if we want to understand it, we need to kind of see how Here. its parts are working and so on. No, no, no. Here, I think I hate this quick, quick, too fast generalization from sciences. But okay, with all my limitations and so on. But isn't the big lesson, if we draw, maybe it's uh, this lesson, maybe it's too quick generalization of quantum physics that precisely we should abandon, and I'm a materialist, I'm not a, but this old idea that the ultimate reality is empty space and, and some uh, stupid particles just floating there. No, you have oscillations, you have ontological ambiguities, waves, and so on. So uh, 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 I don't think that everything that is, is in interaction of individual entities. It, I find it much more productive what some quantum physicists tries to, uh, tries to give form to, the idea that waves, oscillations, are somehow primordial and that particles are interactions of multiple waves. This, I think, again, at all levels, even at social level, we can abandon because here Adorno, I don't believe in his negative dialectics, but he makes a wonderful note somewhere where he says, as you said, today's approach to society moves between the two extremes, either individualism, the starting point are individual, individuals, and then complex structures emerge through their interaction, or he refers, of course, to Emile Durkheim, this organicist approach. Society is the primordial fact, and under certain conditions, different types in each condition of individuals emerge. And then, you know what is Adorno's solution to this? It's not the usual pseudo-Hegelian dialectical synthesis of that, but he says this very antinomy between individualism and social approach, organicist, is the deepest characteristic of our social reality itself. This is not just an antinomy, it in itself has its own moment of truth. And isn't this true today? On the one hand, we are always addressed like individuals, that's neoliberalism, ultimately you are responsible and so on. On the other hand, we talk about these big impersonal objective trends and so on and so on. What about the subjects? Because again, there are sort of two main ideas floating around. One is this kind of extreme naturalistic way of thinking of the subject as just an evolutionary product of is Darwinian it, or selection. Even, sorry, but if you go to the extreme, they even say subject in the sense of subjective experience of your spontaneous activity, free will is, as they call it, user's illusion. And then you have different ways to move up, like some 
be some analysts allow for the idea that through this complexity, complex interaction of pre-subjective parts, something which maybe is not simply an illusion can emerge at the higher level. So, uh, uh, sorry, finish your question. I no, I was going to ask you, how do you see philosophy contributing to this and can, can science in some way contribute to answering the question, what is the subject? Or is that a pure philosophical question that we need to address separately? It, again, it depends on what do you understand as subject. Because usually subject is spontaneously conceived as an agent with this spon spontaneity of action. I look around, I decide, I do what I want, and so on and so on. But I think that in psychoanalytic sense, here Freud has something to say, subject is not primordially this spontaneity of the free will, but it's a set of basic unconscious decisions. The paradox of love is the same as intelligent theologists knew as the paradox of believing in God. Kierkegaard says, if somebody said, Kierkegaard said that if somebody claims I studied different religions and Christianity convinced me, our best arguments, no, he said, that's the worst idea. You only see the arguments for Christianity if you already believe. It's the same with love. I admire whatever, your legs, your smile, sorry for these sexisms, because I'm already in love. So love is on the one hand, a free decision. If there is a free decision, it's to freely fall in love. But it never happens in the present. It's all, at some point, you have already fallen in love. It always has this retroactivity. And here I would say that a different type of subjective freedom emerges, which escapes both this uh, phenomenology of consciousness and uh, 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 scientific uh, and scientific uh, naturalism. Can I take it back to something you said at the beginning of this answer about um, the sort of some limits of a naturalistic approach to the subject, yeah. and you brought up yeah. love for that as an example. Yesterday in your debate with uh, Harari, you said, I'm a naturalist, not an idealist. What do you mean by that? And by naturalist, do you think I simply meant it this is a very complex question, and I consciously took the path of, as I tastelessly referred to it a couple of times, like, I will not pull, and he did not pull the knife out, you know. No, I am naturalist just in the sense that I don't think there is the higher force or whatever that everything there is in, is in some broader sense nature. But for me, this doesn't mean that there is a zero level, like what I mentioned before, empty space and some stupid particles. We never, the lesson of quantum physics for me is that we never really reach this zero level. That, that, uh, that uh, uh, at zero level, we don't have clear image of empty space and particles. What we get is some kind of uh, wave oscillations and now they are making great advances. I like the hypothesis with new quantum physicists. I'm too stupid to really see the scientific value. But I found, for example, the Italian guy, Marco Rovelli, I think. You should get him here. Carlo Rovelli, yeah, he's been to the festival a few times. He's been, because I read, I must admit it, just some of his popular books. His point is that space and time are themselves quantified. You cannot like in that uh, famous uh, uh, paradox of infinite subdivision. No, there is a minimum quantum of space and time. And then in a very intelligent way, he tries to develop the concept of matter out of this primordial tension of time, space, and space. And he goes even further, claiming that space has priority here. And now, again, it's not up to me to, what, what I like is just that 
the problem is not we know the basic level of it to what we have to reduce things, and then it goes more and more complex. I think that at uh, the ground level, we get a big mess. Mm. Not just because of the limit of our knowledge. That reality is in itself, I like to repeat this motif, ontologically open, not fully constituted. And so uh, at this level, I try, it's high speculation, I don't know how it works, I try to, not the way Roger Penrose does, he is also one of those who try, to somehow locate the opening for human freedom already at this quantum level. But not in this, no, Roger Penrose is more intelligent, but some simplistic quantum guys simply say, oh, if there is contingency, blah, blah, doesn't this open uh, space for freedom? No, because never forget, freedom is not contingency. Freedom is free decision, determination. If you just, Okay, it's not contingent, really. But if you leave your decision like you threw a, 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 threw a coin in the air, which side? This is not freedom. You don't decide freely. It's just contingency. And I am heavily working on that because uh, my... Okay, I will give you now a direct formula, which will probably mean nothing, but that's the... I hate these words, metaphysical core of my work now. Uh, I take Buddhism very seriously. But the ultimate Buddhist wisdom is nirvana void. And I had wonderful debates in China, in Japan, with Buddhists. And we ended up in a deadlock because from my standpoint, maybe I'm wrong, I appeared an idiot to them. But from my standpoint, they avoided the key question which is the Hegelian question, not can we really break out of this wheel of desire into the primordial peace void nirvana, but how did this primordial peace get disturbed? How did appearances appear, emerge? And this is what also Hegel says. The problem is not this old Kantian one, what is behind appearances. The problem is precisely, uh, precisely how can, from something flat, stupid, just reality out there, appearances emerge. And to ground this, I am going to the end, and I claim, but they told me that some Tibetan Buddhists have an idea of it, that it's not just nirvana and then false appearances, that there is a deeper tension in the void in nirvana itself. It's somehow in an infinite self-contradiction. So it's a beautiful theory which finds way in, I love them, with modern European uh, mystique by modern, I mean in the old-fashioned sense, uh, Meister Eckhart and then Jakob Böhme, who said that, isn't this a beautiful answer? You know why God created the world? To avoid his own madness. It was kind of a work therapy you know, so I'm looking, for me, the ultimate answer is not provided by Buddhism, this eternal peace or whatever, but some kind of a radical, almost pre-ontological gap, disturbance. That's what comes really first. And I try to elaborate this, and then my idea is that in human subjectivity, this primordial rift gap somehow re-emerged, but it's very speculative. So in some way, your naturalism, as it were, sees the primordial ontological state of reality finding its way all the way to the human subject. Yes, yes, yes. This, I, and I'm not saying that it can find its way only in human subjectivity. I am not, in this sense, anthropocentric, as if you know, the whole of the world was, this is Kantian position too, that the world was really created, Kant says this somewhere, reality was created so that we can fight our moral struggles in it, no? But in some sense, Kant is right, you know, only in what sense that we always 
read the past from our present. And from our human experience, we just should never forget that this was a total contingency. Like, I believe as a good Hegelian in total contingency. Like, who knows? Are we aware? I said this yesterday. People don't like to hear it, that we humans emerge out of double, triple catastrophes. Can you imagine what must have happened on our Earth millions of years ago for us to have deposits of coal and oil? Can you even imagine these catastrophes? We now know today that the asteroid which kills dinosaurs created the conditions for humanity. So the art for me is to be totally open towards the future in the sense of things happen contingently, but nonetheless not to forget that every present moment, at least in our human universe, retro retroactively interprets the past in a teleological way. Somehow, you know, it's like falling in love. Again, I'm sorry. You walk on a street, sorry for the tasteless example, but not vulgar. You, you, you sleep on a banana peel. A lady helps you to get up. Maybe you discover it's the love of your life. So although you know well it was a pure contingency, but the way you experience it, all the, your life, if you're a romantic like I am, you are waiting for that moment. We have to live with this contradiction. So philosophy is like falling in love. Absolutely, absolutely. I think philosophy is falling in love in the sense that it's, uh, you know what, Harari, I would have many things to debate with him, but there I sincerely agreed with him, where he said, Freedom is, freedom is, uh, is uh, never a conclusive state, now I am free. Freedom is the very eternal doubt, am I free or not, and so on. And I think it's the same with love. The moment you don't doubt your love, the moment you think you know why you are in love, it's finished. So they both have this... Uh, this, uh, this uh, retro, retroactivity. And what fi I find it so sad today, I hate it. My uh, French friend, Alain Badiou, pointed this out. In uh, English and in French, and in some other languages, not in all, the verb, a very correct one, which uses to fall in love. And one should give to the verb fall all this radicality. You go, all of a sudden, boom, you fall. What I hate so much, I don't believe it, I'm here all metaphy metaphysician, with this idea, but I have different needs, maybe polyamory works, you are good for this, you are good for that. No, sorry, this is not love. This is your different needs and so on. Love is something else. It's much more non-conditional. And what I fear is that, <clears throat> you know, when I was young, there was a more conservative erotic pedagogy to be, to have multiple partners was considered pathological. Even psychoanalysts were usually, anal what are you, why are you running, if you are a man, sorry for the male chauvinist and heterosexual, why are you running from one woman to another? What are you escaping from, your mother or what? Now in Argentina, maybe the most psychoanalyzed country in the world when I was there, they told me, and I find this sad decadence, that it's the opposite. If you jump from one woman to the other, for women also, if you change partners, it's considered normal. If you are faithful to your partner, they say, oh my God, this is pathological fixation, we have to analyze it, and so on. I think beneath this, it's not just liberation, we are, no, it's a sad redefinition of love in the term of your needs, maybe you need more this, more of that, and then maybe only different people can do it. This is not love. I don't make a compromise here. I want this passionate love, but not, you know where I am not romanticist. I, I understand uh, Orpheus and Eurydice. 
You may, may don't know it, but the German cultural critique he is now old. Thirty years ago, Klaus Teveleit provided a wonderful interpretation of why does bringing her up from underworld, why does Orpheus look back? It's not that because he was worried, Eurydice made some sounds, he was worried. The idea is that when, while she was following him and he was prohibited to look at her back, when she was following him up by divine grace, he started to ask serious questions like, okay, she's my ideal, but wait a minute. To live with this woman who will wash the dishes, all that stuff, what if I get disappointed? Isn't it better to get rid of her and I retain her as an ideal, I write poems, but I can do what I want with other women. So she look, she looked back, bye-bye, I will celebrate you all my life, but I will be rid of you. That's not true love. True love is that, true love, Lacan says this somewhere, doesn't idealize the partner. True love is not idealization. You expect all the small imperfections and you love the person even more because of this. Slavoj Zizek, thank you very much. For podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.